So now that we've talked about why, or now we've motivated why we need synchronization and monitor objects in general, let's talk about a specific part of what monitor objects provide, which is essentially synchronization. So we're going to talk first about synchronized methods that are provided by the Java built-in monitor objects in order to be able to support future exclusion, which we've talked about is protecting shared state in critical sections. So let's talk about synchronized methods first. So to do this, we're going to show a new example. This is busy synchronized queue. And as the name implies, it's synchronized, so it's going to be busy. And it will also implement the badly queue. And we're going to use this to showcase the built-in synchronization mechanisms that we have here in monitor objects. You can get that example back here. So busy synchronized queue implements bounded queue, just like buggy queue did. And it has a little bit more stuff in it. Um, as we'll see, it's got more or less the same data structures. It's got a linked list and a capacity and so on. Um, and this state, of course, is what needs to be protected against race conditions by corruption through multiple threats. The constructor simply initializes things. And then we have, I'll show three methods. There's a few more, but here are the three representative methods, offer, poll, and is empty. And as you can see, each of these methods is marked as synchronized. So what does that mean? It means a synchronized method means that calls to this method will be serialized with respect to any other synchronized method call in this object. So if you have two different objects, they aren't synchronized. I mean, they may be synchronized with respect to other methods in the object, but it's the object that's the unit and the, method is, the methods are what are synchronized on the object. And you'll see that in more detail in a second. So think about this much like we talked about before for the ranch of lock, where you're going to take turns. And you can't interleave the behavior. You, the method call is the boundary of synchronization. When you use the synchronized keyword in the method declaration, like we're showing here, that means the entire method body is serialized. So that means that when the opening curly brace is hit, you'll have to wait in the entrance queue until you're the only one in in the critical section. And when you're done, when the close curly brace is hit at the end, that's going to release that thread from owning the critical section. And then another thread can come along and go in. Now here's a little bit of subtle detail. So synchronization is actually considered to be an implementation detail. It's, it's actually not strictly part of the method signature. So what the heck does that mean? What that means is that synchronize, the synchronized modifier, is not inherited when subclasses override superclass methods. So if you were to find some other class that was not a busy synchronized queue, but a synchronized queue, and we didn't put synchronize in front of these method signatures, or in the method signatures, these methods themselves would not be synchronized. So synchronized synchronized modifier is not inherited. You could, of course, make these synchronized by having you know, a synchronized statement, which we'll look at in just a second. But, but out of the box, just having this will not make them synchronized. So, so, so you know what I'm about the signature function is not a method that must be synchronized? Great question. So the question is, what does it mean to be synchronized on an object? It means that there's a monitor lock that's part of the object state. And each method that's part of that object will have to acquire that lock. So there's one lock that all the methods in that object share. If you were to have two objects and multiple threads, a method that's synchronized in one object doesn't affect the method that's synchronized in another object. The objects are independent, and there are different locks in each one. Yeah? That's not, like, is that any different from if the entire method had Ah, great question. So the question is, what's the difference between putting synchronize here versus having synchronize this at the beginning of each method? We'll talk about that in just a second, but that's a great question. So here are kind of the pros and cons of synchronized methods. So the, the pro is that you can see sort of by looking at the interface whether it's synchronized or not, right? It's kind of a documentation aid. Even though the synchronized keyword is not strictly part of the method signature, it's part of the method declaration, it's part of the declaration of what it's doing, so you can see it at a glance. The syntax is very compact, so you just you synchronize there, you're done. And the method, this goes back to Duncan's question, the method is the unit of synchronization. So the methods are the, the unit at which things are synchronized. And that's pretty easy to reason.
is about and think about. The downside, and this goes to uh, Nissa's question, um, or part of this. So if you synchronize on the method, that is the equivalent of synchronizing on this, which is what you're asking. And one of the consequences of doing that is that means that other objects can also synchronize on that object, which is kind of weird, right? Because any object in Java that's not a built-in object, any object of a class that's not a built-in type, can be synchronized on. You can say synchronize foo. And so somebody else can be synchronizing on your monitor lock, which could have additional contention for you. That takes a while to get your head around. So if you want to learn more about it, go take a look at this link here. Um, and then when we look at synchronized statements, which we'll look at in a second, you'll see that that's different and why it's different. The other thing that's the real issue here, though, is that the granularity of locking is fairly coarse strength. So it's on a per object, per method basis which means that you're locking the entire method, which could be overkill. That will become more clear when I look at the next part of this lesson. Okay. So that's the end of... This is the second part of our synchronization discussion for Java built-in monitor objects. Here, we're going to talk about synchronized statements and compare and contrast them with synchronized methods. And as you'll see, synchronized statement does a variety of things, but you have to have more explicit indication of where the synchronization is going to take place. There's a number of problems with synchronized methods which we talked about and some constraints on them. One, that they can yield excessive overhead due to coarse grain serialization, because serialization occurs at the per method basis, which may be too coarse grain, as we'll see in a second. And you also always synchronize on the implicit lock, like this. And that could be a source of contention uh, in a variety of use cases. So because of those limitations with synchronized methods, Java supports other things. So first, let's quickly show what the problems are. So let's assume that we're going to look at an implementation of the Java Exchanger class. This is one of the Java class library classes. And it basically defines a synchronization point where threads can pair up and swap elements in pairs. They can basically synchronize with each other and swap elements. It's basically a resource exchange. So let's assume for sake of argument that we have a method called create slot. Don't worry too much about what this is going to do. It's just an implementation private method. And let's say that we synchronize it at the method level. So we come along and this method gets called. This is synchronized. No other threads can be running at this point. We come in, we make ourselves a new slot. We get ourselves an arena, which is going to be basically a, a, uh, an array of slots up to a certain capacity. It's kind of a pre-cached, pre-allocated place to store slots and then allocate them on demand. If the index here is null, that means we haven't initialized it yet, so we're going to go ahead and make this the new slot, we're going to, and we're going to do it in a lazy way. It's called lazy creation. If it's null, we go ahead and put it there. The problem with this is, as you'll see when we look at the other solution, this is overly pessimistic. We're synchronizing pieces of code that don't need to be synchronized. There's no need to have to actually have the lock held while we're doing certain things. In particular, these two things here do not need to be locked. So another way to do this is to use a synchronized statement. So here, create slot when it gets called. This code here, like new slot, that doesn't need to be protected by a lock because that's not something that will be a source of race conditions. Assigning the arena to this slot variable, that doesn't need to be protected by a lock because it's basically read-only operation. Only the part where we're going to check and then modify actually needs to be synchronized. So here, we're going to synchronize this, and then we're going to go ahead and do the things that need to be locked. And so this is an example of a synchronized statement, which is at a finer level of granularity than a synchronized method. So the point there is that the lock is held for a shorter part of the code. And in a system with lots of threads that are running, you want to try to keep your critical sections as short as possible because that maximizes potential concurrency. This really only becomes an issue if you have a lot of threads, or a lot of uh, cores, but let's assume we have that because most systems these days have lots of cores. So you can see here that we're creating a slot outside of the synchronized block, and that doesn't need to be locked, so the region is only very small. Often we use synchronized 
statements on the implicit lock on this. But that's not required. And this goes back to the other deficiency with synchronized methods where you always use the this. So it's perfectly plausible, instead of synchronizing on this, to synchronize on something else, like this arena, for example. Um, and you can have other things you can synchronize. Basically, anything that's not a built-in type instance can be synchronized upon, because they all have a, a, uh, an entrance queue on them. So here we can basically synchronize at a finer level. So not only can we synchronize only a portion of the method, but we can also, if we, if we needed to, we don't show that in this example, but we could have different synchronizers and synchronize different parts of the method with different objects, thereby reducing contention for one synchronizer object. And you'll, we'll see some examples of this later when we talk about Java link blocking queues, which actually do this in picture technique. It's really cool. So in cases where the intrinsic lock is too limited or too contended, we can synchronize an individual thing. Now, that's pretty much what you're doing, by the way, not although for a slightly different reason, in the fair semaphore implementation. You're actually synchronizing on individual weight objects or weight locks. There we're doing it for specific notification purposes, but in general you can synchronize on things other than this. That was the key point for that. Okay, a lot more information is available here at the Oracle website talking about synchronized locks and synchronized statements <coughs> and intrinsic locks and so on and so forth. Good stuff. So pros and cons, you can use a private field as a synchronizer so the implementation details are hidden so somebody else can't come along and synchronize with this thing, for example. And you can find the synchronized statements by using your integrated development environment searching for where the references are actually used that just so that you can figure out where they're, where they're coming from. The downside is the syntax is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more verbose. It might make the code a little harder to read. But in practice, it's not that hard. You just have to remember that that's what's going on. Let me show you one more thing. This is the double check locking pattern using the techniques we're describing. So uh, there's an interesting pattern that you can read about here. This is, this is one of my fundamental contributions to the world of Java concurrency. If you read this link, you'll find out why. I wrote a paper many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, that talked about this optimization technique called double check locking optimization. And it turned out to, that that optimization broke the Java virtual machine. And so the people who worry about those kinds of things had to go and fix the Java virtual machine. And there's lots of papers and all kinds of learned discussion by deep thinkers about concurrency, about how to fix Java to make it work. So this is a quick summary of what it does. So double check locking is basically a lazy allocation technique that only synchronizes when initialization is, is first done. And so here's how it works in the exchanger. Uh, what happens here is when you're doing this exchange stuff, if the slot is null, then we're going to call create slot. So notice that this check, if slot equal null, that is actually not locked. So this is the double check lock. When we first check here, we, we go and say, is the slot null? And if the answer is yes, that means it hasn't been initialized, we call create slot. And then here, when we actually do the initialization, then we grab the lock. And that's what double check locking is all about. And I'll let you read, I'll let you read the article here if you want to to find out more about why this is important and useful. But it's it's a pretty cool technique. And so that's how it's being used. And once again, synchronized blocks, synchronized statements, allow us to get the right level of granularity for this stuff. So we only make a slot if the current slot is null. Uh, and we only synchronize during initialize. Okay, so that's the end of the second part of our discussion of Java monitor objects.